with this, let me get started. So this morning, we have Ivan Ellicott. So Ivan uh, is uh, in the Department of Geographical Sciences. This is another area of science that is involved in wildfire research. Uh, his expertise is in remote sensing, and he's going to talk about this. So Ivan, you have the Thank you, Arnav. Good morning, everybody. Um, so yes, I'm covering remote sensing and wildfires, and it's been a, a really interesting and productive collaboration to work with the engineering department over the last I don't know, five plus years. Um, just that interdisciplinary science of sharing ideas, sharing our, our knowledge from our wheelhouses. So I'm going to talk about remote sensing, as you can see here. Um, you do a quick Google search for wildfires remote sensing, and quickly you'll get back something like 64,000 hits. Um, it's obviously a large topic. Um, I'm showing you here a particular polar orbiting satellite um, with a sensor called VIRS. I'll get more into that later from the end of May. You can see this is global fire detections. Um, I'll point out some other interesting uh, tidbits about this in a moment. So just, again, my department, Geographical Sciences, I'm an associate research professor. Um, this is a Landsat 8, a different sensor, and let me start off with saying I realize there's probably a spectrum of knowledge when it comes to remote sensing in this audience. Um, so I'm going to try and find the Goldilocks and not dumb it down too much, but not to talk, talk too high level. Um, so different resolution in both time and space. Um, does anybody know what fire this is? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Campfire. I mean, it's a good, it's a great picture. Um, so this was detected early by uh, PG&E crews, but satellites quickly picked it up, the, particularly the geostationary satellites, and I'll, and I'll get into that in a moment. So there's some stats <coughs> for you. That was a, obviously a big year for fires. Um, this one burned over 150,000 acres and resulted in almost 100 deaths and over 18,000 structures destroyed. So, air quality today, woo, it's much better. You can see here, um, it's moderate. Um, if you look at the left image though, that is from Wednesday. And you can see that purple was headed our way, which we got <coughs> yesterday. Um, on Wednesday, Toronto had the second worst air quality in the world, followed by New York, or no, actually, sorry, they were third, New York was second. Um, and you can see how, I'll point on here because I know the folks may not know where I'm pointing to this trough of air bringing things down and how it was sort of entrained. There was a cold front, there's an anticyclonic behavior, anywhere more the atmospheric science of uh, things. But that's why it eventually, let me clear this, uh, came <coughs> down to us. Um, so you're seeing yesterday, both in terms of a true color satellite image and the, the um, near surface smoke. And micrograms per meter square or per meter cubed. Um, and then today, this is the predicted for today. Um, it looks bad, but it's not purple. So we're doing a little better. Anyway, I figured it would, I'd be remiss if I didn't show this sort of stuff. All right, I'm going to just give a, a quick background about me. I was talking with some folks here about our different um, wheelhouses or silos or where we come from. So my background is in ecology. Um, I started with wildlife ecology and then got into fire ecology. I was working at the Albany Pine Bush as an intern um, and got into doing prescribed fires because that particular community of uh, forest, the pitch pine scrub oak um, barrens ecosystem, and they were trying to uh, recover a corner blue butterfly. And that particular ecosystem requires frequent burning, low intensity. Um, so I got an opportunity to get into prescribed fires. Um, and learn more about fire ecology in addition to the ecology I was learning already. Um, that later transitioned into, I worked for the Forest Service, looking at the connection between forest fires and spotted owls. I know other colleagues who were doing this in California even recently. Um, while I was out there, there was these enormous fires. This is the Rodeo Chetiskai fire uh, in 2002. And I started to get into, for my master's, geospatial intelligence or remote sensing. So I was sort of transitioning along. And as a, a good geographer, it's, I'm interdisciplinary. I study a lot of different things. Um, maybe not a master of any of them. Sort of jack of all trades. Um, but 
for my PhD, I started studying um, global fire and associated fire energy and um, emissions and was estimating organic and black carbon emissions on a global scale. Um, so I'm going to probably not cover all the things on this outline. I realized I only have an hour. I got to move quickly. So bear with me if I skip through some things or talk too quickly. Stop me if you have questions, but maybe we'll keep those to the can end. I, can I stop you? Can you clarify what the black carbon and organic carbon is? It's a type of aerosol. Um, so I think it was Guillermo who was talking about burning and the type of fire, the type of combustion results in a different type of smoldering fire will have organic carbon, flaming will just black carbon. It's sort of counterintuitive when I talk to people about this. They think, well, wouldn't you have if you're smoldering, it's all black. Um, it's inefficient combustion results in organic carbon. Um, so, <coughs> Peter Sunderland also made the difference between what comes out of a cigarette, which is smoldering, and uh, what comes out of a flame. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's a different phase of combustion. Um, so hopefully you can all see this, and in the other room too. Um, this is from June 1st, and I'm, I'm pointing this out. You can see clearly the fires in Canada, in Alberta. Some of the ones that were in um, Toronto, or not Toronto, Ontario, were not quite taking off yet. The Nova Scotia fires were. Um, but what I want to point out here is when we're affected by fires, let's say in the U.S., um, we think we're the only ones affected by fires, it's, whether it's California or our smoke. But it's clearly a global phenomenon. Um, and I want to point out, this is June. If we look at December, you notice the shift, particularly uh, in Africa. You move into the Sahel, and there's always this natural progression of fire activity. Fire in Africa, you could argue Australia or Africa are deemed the fire continent. Um, and then you have South America. One thing you won't see up here is... We get a lot of false detections from satellites out here, from the uh, Southern Magnetic Anomaly. Um, it's, a, it's something that remote sensing has, like anything, it's got its hiccups. Um, so we remove those. And um, what is included here, though, are persistent uh, detections from, say, gas flares, coal seams. I think, again, it was a uh, previous speaker was talking about the coal seams. We do see those. I mean, we detect them, and then solar arrays. We're constantly going through and finding fires that are persistent false alarms. And sometimes we include them. Sometimes we remove them based on user input, um, offshore gas flares. So we have files for that too. But I'll, I'll get into that more later. Next, I want to talk a little bit about humans and fires and statistics, particularly for the U.S. I know others have covered this, so I'll, I'll go through it quickly. In the lower 48, humans are overwhelmingly the root cause of fire ignitions um, for a number of reasons. Arson, uh, trains that spark, um, wildfires that, or campfires that don't get put out. But it's sort of a misnomer in many ways that we call it wildfire. Um, I think the difference is they're not prescribed fires, so they were not meant to happen, so they're wild. Um, but around the world, about 90% of fires are caused by humans. Africa in particular, those are all agricultural fires. They're doing cleaning out crop residue, trying to get rid of pests on the, on the landscape, but there's a number of reasons why they're burning, slash and burn and so forth. Um, suppression costs in the U.S. have gone up dramatically. I don't think this is anything, well, maybe it's new to some. Let me clear this out. Um, but you can see the trend in suppression costs. Um, this is in um, adjusted for inflation, too. The number of fires, this is a maybe misconception that fire activity is increasing. It's actually staying pretty steady in the U.S. Um, and there could be a number of reasons, whether we're engaging fires quicker, um, there's less fire activity because of human interaction as to where they're occurring. There's a number of reasons. I don't want to get into the, the politics of it. But act, active fires and fire activity have sort of stayed a little bit steady um, over the last 20 years or 30 years. But the number of area burned has increased dramatically over time. So we're getting about the same number of fires, but they're getting bigger, more intense, more severe. Um, and you've probably seen these stats before, where some of the biggest fires have been in the last five years, particularly in California. Um, you can see I've pointed them out in red here. So these are recent large wildfires. All right, so that's the background on fires in the U.S. Um, let's talk a little bit about remote sensing. 
So remote sensing literally interpreted as remotely sensed. You put your hand over an oven and you feel that heat you're remotely sensing. You're not directly touching it. That should be pretty straightforward. It's a non-contact method of observing something, um, collecting information without actually making physical contact. And so up here on the slide, you can see we've got a number of different platforms or buses, we might call them, and they've got sensors on them. Um, so here you have two different ways of, of acquiring information. Um, it could be an active approach where you're sending a signal and waiting for a response. You can think of radar or LIDAR, um, or is it passive? You're just waiting for electromagnetic energy from the Earth's surface um, or whatever sur surface you're observing to return to your sensor. And all this is to say it allows you to observe a phenomenon um, or a process that may be inaccessible, uh, may be difficult to get to, may be dangerous, um, and it gives you synoptic, synoptic scales where you can look over long periods of time or large areas, but you can get higher resolution by you know, having a sensor that's lower to the ground, greater area, maybe less resolution as to what you're observing by having a, uh, a satellite. So you can see the scales here of where you might be observing from. So you can also think of remote sensing as any kind of imaging you go to get. It could be radiometers. Uh, you might have buoys um, that are transmitting between a ship and a satellite um, on a regular basis. We're all familiar with, this is Icona um, with NASA, um, and, but we're familiar with these drones and UASs, UAVs, and they are becoming more and more common um, as a way to observe <laughs> Earth observations, let's say. I'm going to focus primarily on, on satellite-based. So a little bit of history. Uh, Nadar, you're probably familiar with. Uh, flew balloons. He was a journalist, photographer, but he was flying balloons and taking photographs of Paris uh, in the late 1800s. Um, we used pigeons, kites. <laughs> um, yeah, I know, it's great. And, and the photographs are pretty fascinating. Some are just, you know, the beak of the bird, but they're, they're the tried things. Um, really, things start to take off with... Um, World War I and military surveillance. I mean, it seems like the military is going to lead the edge on some of these things. So aerial photography for surveillance and reconnaissance, and then really peaking during the Cold War when we started using old aircraft like the U-2 here as, um, you can call them spy craft, right, to, to observe um, other parts of the world. So when we talk about satellite remote sensing, um, we're using what's referred to as Earth-observing platforms and at a synoptic scale. So you have a host of uh, remote sensing instruments. Um, you're using either emitted or reflected radiation like I showed before. Um, the satellites, as I said, are, are either looking for reflected energy from the Earth, like light or heat emitted from the Earth. Um, and there's a wide range of measurements you can make from visible to IR to microwave. So what does it, this mean for Earth observations? You're recording, measuring, and interpreting imagery um, and digital representations, and I should be clear that we're not directly measuring anything. We're making estimates of, of whatever it is, temperatures, um, through relationships um, and uh, correlations that we've developed over time. There's a wide range of sensors, platforms, applications, and then there's many connections to geographical information systems. Um, so I'm going to get into what information, how much detail, and how frequent. Um, I'll do a little bit of background here for the physics. Um, you have passive, as I mentioned, you've got the sun coming in, it hits the Earth's surface, it might interact with the atmosphere if that's what you're studying, um, and you're looking for that reflected energy back to the sensor. Um, and I think it was Peter Sunderland who was talking about electromagnetic radiation, that's exactly what I'm talking about here as well. So this is it. Um, we're talking about electrical fields and magnetic fields, and you can see the difference here along the axis as to where they're um, moving. So you have, with electromagnetic energy, you have wavelengths, the distance from one wave crest to the next, you have frequency, the number of crests, and your amplitude, the height of these peaks that we're interested in. Um, Newton passed white light, as you've all seen this before, um, through a glass prism, um, and got this result. Visible light has a sequence of wavelengths. You're all familiar with this, I'm sure. And here's a good image or figure of these 
these wavelengths. So we use these different channels to make observations of whatever it is that you're interested in. If it's your broken arm, or you're looking at the ozone hole, which luckily is getting smaller. So again, just re reiterating, you've got the atmosphere, you've got scattered energy in the atmosphere, you've got reflected emissive energy, um, I'm sorry, reflected electromagnetic energy, and then you have emitted energy. This would be a warm body, or any kind of body, is um, re-emitting that energy. And then you have to consider all these different interactions. There's different responses based on what you're looking at, the conditions of um, your environment, what, what the condition of the, whether it's the atmosphere, the building, or the forest that you're trying to observe. And as I mentioned, there's passive instruments. They don't emit radiation. Instead, they're waiting, essentially. It measures radiation that is available in the environment. That's what most satellites are using in the, the scale of Earth observations. Um, and then there's active instruments. And these have become more and more common in recent decades, um, where you're using radar um, uh, and LIDAR. So some terminology, spectral resolution. Um, it's the ability to, of a sensor to discern finer wavelengths. Um, so if you have many channels, like a Landsat, say, you're talking multispectral. You could have thousands of channels, and we're talking hyperspectral. So you're really getting to fine detail in the wavelengths. Um, and you can see some difference here in the right-hand side of different channels from Landsat. Spatial resolution, that's probably the most obvious to people. You can go on Google Earth and zoom in, and you'll see how the detail increases as you zoom in. They're stacking different images based on their resolution. Um, so it's the smallest area on Earth that a satellite can observe. It depends on the instrument. Um, high resolution might be less than 10 meters now. It could be centimeters. Low resolution, um, maybe 10 kilometers. There's a trade-off, though. If you have high resolution, you can't observe a very large area at a single time. If you have a large resolution, or a low spatial resolution, like a kilometer, you can observe more frequently. If you're using a geostationary weather satellite, like I showed earlier, when you're 36,000 kilometers out from Earth, you're observing all the time, but your resolution is like two kilometers, and that's an improvement from what it was. And then you have temporal resolution. Again, this goes back, it's an interplay between spatial um, there's, and temporal as to how frequent you can observe a single spot on Earth. If you're polar orbiting, meaning you're circling the Earth daily, you get two looks at pretty much the same spot every day. Um, if you're geostationary, you may be dwelling and observing it all the time. Um, so this is what we're talking about with temporal resolution. And then radiometric resolution, it's the sensitivity of the electromagnetic energy um, and the magnitude of it that the sensor has. So you hear about 8-bit versus 16-bit, um, and that's what we're talking about, is how much detail can you get and information can be stored for any um, sensor and its pixels. So here's a difference between, or example of radiometric resolution. This is Chicago. You're seeing 16-bit radiometric resolution. Um, so you're getting over 65,000 different shades of gray. Um, in the middle, you got 8-bit. And on the right, you've got 4-bit. And you can see how it starts getting very grainy, blocky. Um, and what I want to be, mention is that that there's trade-offs between all three of these, spatial, spectral, and radiometric. You have to, the engineers designing these, working with the user community, have to figure out what's the most ideal for what you want to observe. Um, types of satellite I've already mentioned is you've got geostationary, they're dwelling. Um, polar orbiting are also called sun synchronous, meaning they're in line and they're moving as the Earth moves. Um, they're going over the pole, the Earth is moving, so they're observing the same spot on the Earth um, at the same time pretty much every day. Let's see if this works. It'll take a minute. Um, you see right here this. Oh, this group of satellites right here coming around is referred to as the A-Train. Um, it's the afternoon constellation, but these are all, you can see 25 different satellites orbiting the Earth at any given time. Um, and that number has actually increased over the years. Um, some are decommissioned, some are slowly what we refer to as having orbital drift. They're losing their, their position in space uh, for 
mostly fuel reasons. They're running out of fuel and we're allowing them to, as we decommission them, um, if you've ever heard of the Terra satellite, um, and Aqua's not far behind it, they've outlived their lifespan, and so we're starting to allow them to drift in. Okay, so let me go. Um, this is uh, sorry, NOAA's suite of different platforms in, in space. You've got everything from deep space observations, uh, polar orbiting, and geostationary. So just giving you a sense. And there's a lot of collaboration between the U.S. and other space agencies, whether it's JAXA, the Japanese space agency, UMETSAT and ISA, the Europeans, um, Indian space agency. So there's a lot of collaboration. And I'll show you a little more of the different platforms on that. Um, so geostationary, I mentioned this before, high altitude orbital period of satellite matches the rotational speed of the Earth. So it's constantly moving with us, staying in that geostationary dwelling location. Um, it has limited geographic range, um, meaning it's usually, and I'll show you a little bit, as you can see at the disk here on the figure, um, it's not going to see the entire Earth. It's going to see an area of the Earth that we wanted to observe. Um, and it's, they were initially developed, like many of these satellites, um, for meteorological conditions um, and storm development. So when we want to know the weather, we're relying on geostationary satellites along with these polar orbiting satellites to tell us what is happening currently and what we can expect in the future. Um, two of the main ones in the <coughs> U.S. Um, launched early 1970s uh, are the GOES, Geostationary Environmental Operational Satellites. They've improved dramatically over time in the number of channels that they have and the spatial resolution that they have. The new ones now have um, a GLM, uh, a Geostationary Lightning Mapper. They have uh, MAG, which is a Magnetometer, mag, magnetometer. Um, but the one we typically use is ABI, Advanced Baseline Imager, which has 16 channels. Um, and this is just from the other day. This is, you're seeing what's called goes 18 or west and goes east. And as you can see, goes east is really dwelling about, you can see about to um, the Utah, Nevada border, um, but it's really, stationary over the eastern part of the U.S. and South America. Um, these are the 16 channels. I'm not going to go through all of them for the sake of time, but you can see how they're observing different phenomena in the atmosphere and on the Earth's surface. So the range is anywhere from about a half a micron to 13 microns. Polar orbiting, uh, orbiting satellites, they're low Earth orbit. LEO, um, anywhere from 700 to 800 kilometers. Um, they orbit around the poles. There is usually a descending and ascending pattern to them, uh, depending upon the time of day. Um, Earth rotates under the satellites, um, and polar orbiting satellites are, very, like I said already, about the same spot every day on Earth, usually at least once or twice a day, once during the day, once at night. Um, low temporal resolution, um, not like the geostation that are dwelling, but they have greater um, spatial resolution. This is one I mentioned earlier, Terra, that is slowly being decommissioned, um, and the number of the different sensors that it has on board. And it's been up there since 1999. And that really was a game changer for satellites. So that and its partner, Aqua, another satellite with the same sensors, they get about four looks a day of Earth, uh, or any particular location on Earth. Um, I'll skip this in the interest of time. So what are the applications we can use for remote sensing before I jump into wildfire specifically? Agricultural monitoring, uh, disaster monitoring, um, risk assessment, studying urban geography. There's a number of things, sea surface temperature and so on. Um, but what we're here talking about is wildfires. Um, and this is in a, in a good image of Goes West, at that time it was Goes 17. Goes 17 has had some cooler issues, um, so it's been put into backup or reserve. But this is monitoring fires during 2020. Um, this particular image or this um, loop is from September 8th. Uh, and then this is Goes East. So you see how we can see across the, the North American continent to observe fires. Um, this is the Dixie Fire. But I want to take a step back for a moment and 
just say, when did we start observing fires from a remote location? And it goes back to lookout fires or lookout towers. They're really not used much anymore, um, but they were a mainstay of fire operations and fire management. So after the Great Fire of 1910, um, these were put into um, practice. Um, by the 1930s, there was over 5,000 lookout towers constructed. The um, Pennsylvania actually started using them again in 2017. And there was even lookout trees used, and you can find the register of lookout trees around the country. Um, and then Fairview Peak is the highest one, just for you know, some little tidbit of information at 13,000 feet. That's it right there. But we're here talking more about remote sensing from the sense of either aircraft or satellite. So the U.S. Forest Service was sort of a late adopter to the UAS program, to UAVs, drones, and so forth. Um, but now it has 65 operators. CAL FIRE launched its own program in 2021. Um, you can see here some of the different types of uh, platforms, whether it's rotor, fixed wing, um, and these are manned and unmanned. Um, they could be used for situational awareness, aircraft assistance, and ignitions. Um, I know folks who are using them in crews on fires for that situational awareness. So just a quick little background, a little bit of science, and a little history on remote sensing and wildfire. So this is what we're talking about, right? The process is a landscape process of fire. You've got smoldering, flaming. Um, we've heard a bunch of this already over the past week. So what we're observing, and we've, I, I've seen a number of talks that have discussed this, um, is that combustion releases heat energy through a number of different pathways, convection, uh, conduction, vaporization, and radiation. And it's the radiant component that we're observing with satellites. Um, you can see where on the, the radiance on the, the right graph here, where black body of the Earth is around 300 K, um, fires typically around 1,000 K. Um, so we're, I'll get into that in a moment, where we use, we exploit these curves uh, to observe fires. So I've already talked about how it, combustion releases fuel energy as radiation and emitted gases and aerosols. We're taking advantage of Planck's law, the distribution by wavelength, Wayne's displacement law, um, which is the wavelength of maximum energy, and then Stefan Boltzmann for the total energy, uh, rate of energy. And we're assuming carbon particles behave nearly as black bodies. So here's the, the Planck function, right? You can see where the ideal wavelength here um, for observing fires around 1,000 K uh, would be, maybe be around uh, 2 microns. But there's a problem with 2 microns, and that's solar energy. So at night, 2 microns is great, but during the day, we get um, interference from solar reflective energy confusing the signal. So you can see here this again where the flaming, smoldering, unburned, and the sun. We have found, and I'll show you more of this, that the 3.9 micron channel is ideal for remote sensing um, because it doesn't get influenced as much by solar energy being reflected. Um, and it's in a nice window where it avoids CO2 and water absorption in the atmosphere. So here you can see the windows for um, CO2 and H2O, and this is where we want to be right here in this window. So a, a bit of the little history. So we were observing coal seams and forest fires back in the 60s and 70s using thermal imagers, whether it was IR. Um, Satellite-based imaging really started to take off with a satellite sensor referred to as AVHRR, the Advanced Very High Resolution Radiometer. Um, that satellite, though, had problems with orbital drift, initial calibration, so it would saturate the pixels. Um, and the, it was not an not an ideal band placement. It was around 2.7. That might not sound like a big difference between 2.9, but there was a bit of CO2 and water absorption in that channel. Um, starting in the 90s with the geostationary satellite GOES, there was improvement on some of those things, and we continued to use that satellite for fire observations. It wasn't until MODIS, the Moderate Resolution Im Imaging Spectrometer, that was launched in 1999, as I mentioned, with Terra, and then in 2002 with Aqua, respectively, that we had sort of a game-changing science where the engineering was built to detect fires. It wasn't um, a meteorological satellite that someone said, oh, look, we can detect fires with this. 
this was actually intended to, to look for and measure and characterize fires. And we've been lucky because we've had that sensor now for 20 years when it was only meant to last seven. Um, and now we have another new sensor that was based somewhat on MODIS, which is called VIRS, Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite. And that's been two, 2012 to present. Um, and I want to be clear, this is not obviously the entire history of remote sensing and fire. I'm just giving a little tidbit. There's other countries that are doing it as well, other space programs, and there's other satellites that are doing it and have their own history and, and um, their own technology. So um, here you can see MODIS. This is from Terra, um, launched, like I said, in 1999. Bands specifically were built for and placed detecting fires, detecting burned area or measuring burned area. Um, I won't go into the background, but if you look up a, a Jeff Dogere, um, in 1981, he was the first to really come up with this idea that we could see fires by looking at the difference between a number of different channels um, on these satellites. So I'm not sure if you can see this very well in the graph, in the, the figure. This is from a colleague of mine, Louis Giglio. Um, the way the detection method works is you're looking for an elevated signal in that four micron. I'm calling it four broadly, but it's really like 3.97 when we're being specific. But there is a window, there's a little bit of um, give and take on either side of that central channel. Um, so we look for that. We use the 11 micron to observe the background surface of the Earth, because that's long wave and that's what the Earth is emitting. Um, and then we use a bunch of other channels to help um, our certainty of detection, rejecting false alarms. And you can see on the right-hand side from this figure how we use um, the, the red channel, the near-infrared, some SWIR shortwave infrared channels for things like sun glint, bright surfaces to avoid false detections. Um, but this approach has pretty much been adopted by all space agencies, um, whether it's ESA, the European Space Agency, on their Sentinel-3 satellite, um, or, or the Japanese space agency, this has been proven to be a, a sound and effective approach for detecting fires. I will note, this is a, a global algorithm, and various regions around the world, I've worked with folks in Alaska, they fine tune it to their environment, because there are different, obviously, conditions where you might be getting signals from the surface where it's not tree covered, it's um, a bright, hot surface, and that's causing a problem. So it can be adapted for the particular context and environment. Um, just showing again how you've got emitted energy from the background, you've got reflected energy, and how we're really looking during the daytime at this four micron channel to help avoid some of the reflected solar energy um, and account for emitted background energy from the Earth's surface and then from the fires. Um, this gives you an idea of the detection envelopes, as we refer to them, from MODIS and VIRS. Um, this was done through modeling when um, we were testing out VIRS. Um, it has a higher spatial resolution, 750 meters for one of the imagers and 375 for the other, where MODIS is a one kilometer pixel. Um, but you can see how well we can do depending on the temperature of the fire. And again, this is assuming you're looking straight down Nader. But with this kind of information and at a global scale, you can start to do um, fire regime characterization. So this is the number of pixel density. So this is, at, it's been improved since then, but this is at 0.5 degree over the earth. Where are the greatest number of fire detections in a given year? And then with that, we can also look at what's the peak month of fire detection around the globe. I want to note though that um, there are factors that affect all of this, and we have to constantly account for these. So how big is the fire, the temperature, the biome, the season? Um, but things that really get in the way, clouds, um, types of clouds, the position of the sun, the viewing geometry of the satellite, um, smoke, instrument issues, and there's a, a variety of things we have to account for. Um, so hopefully that's clear. Like we, You can't always be certain and perfect, but we try our best, and we're constantly improving the, the algorithm. In fact, we're up to what's now called Collection 6. So it's since the early 2000s, we've been improving that algorithm. Um, there's another characteristic that we can get from satellites too, which is burned area. This started in the 1970s when people were looking at Landsat data to look at vegetative health. 
You may have heard of uh, indice referred to as NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetative Index. You're looking at differences between the red and the near infrared to say how healthy is the vegetation. And you can see the signals here for unburned, surface fire, crown fire, right, and the reflectance in those channels. Um, another indice that was in was created was the normalized burn ratio, and it's uh, specifically trying to look at fires by accounting for background. So it's looking for things like sphere <coughs> channels or using sphere channels. Um, you can also do burned area with SAR, synthetic aperture radar. Um, it's this is a great tool to have or a sensor when, let's say, you're looking at Indonesia. You've got peat fires, it's incredibly smoky, and you're trying to detect how much area is burned. You can't do it with optical sensors, you just can't penetrate the clouds. Um, or you're looking in places like uh, the Amazon, and you've got persistent cloud cover. So SAR has been really prove, proven useful for looking in these areas. Um, it's a bit more complex. Um, it's not as straightforward as you can see with an image of Clearly, we can look at the burn in an optical sensor. It's not as straightforward with this, but it is proven to be effective. Um, these are just showing you different, and not a complete list, of different satellites, who owns them, how long they've been operating for, and the spatial and temporal resolution. But this is just a snapshot of various sensors over the last couple decades that are trying to um, estimate burned area. So this is a global map of burned area on August 2015. Um, and with this monthly burned area, you can incorporate that into something like this, which is the Global Fire Emissions Database. Um, and this is a pretty well regarded and well often used data set um, for global emissions. And they've got a number of different um, species, whether gases or aerosols, based on emission factors. Um, all right, I'm going to get into the last number of <coughs> slides here. I'll try and move quickly, but just talk a little bit about, like, we, we talk about these detections and characterizations and how much energy is coming off a of fire from a satellite, but how do we really know that's true? Well, we do a lot of CalVal. Uh, again, I think it was Guillermo who was talking about testing it out and do field trips. We do field trips all the time, um, and often we don't do them in the U.S. because you can't burn here too easily. So we go to other countries to burn. Um, but, <laughs> but we do burn here when we can. So this is actually um, from, from Maryland, not far from here. So I work with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources with their fire, forest fire team. Um, and they do regular conservation burns. And they let me set up sensors and fly drones around. And I'll time that with satellite overpasses. Um, we do this in the US when we're allowed to, working with CAL FIRE, which is in the lower left, and on the upper left um, is from the rim fire. So that was afterwards, coming and observing what was the impact, so we're looking at burned area. On the right is Kruger National Park, where we worked with a number of folks from South Africa and other universities around the world to do experimental burns. This is just more, this is from Virginia, where again we worked with the Forest Service in Virginia, to start fires. They were going to do it anyway. They're doing prescribed fires, so they let us set up sensors. We do some field measurements before they start the fire, and then we fly. You can see the little drone here that we're observing with a radiometer um, and a small FLIR camera. That fire didn't go well. The winds picked up, and you can see sort of with a, the middle image there, that's not how it should have looked. Um, winds picked up. It started spotting over the ridge line, and they were like, okay, we're done. No more instruments or anything flying around. Um, we have go down to a colleague of mine is from Brazil. Let's see if this plays. So we go down, we've gone down there um, and worked with the Brazilian Space Agency. Um, we had two drones flying in tandem. They're just these little DJI phantom drones, but they were effective. And we had a, a little FLIR again and a little radiometer flying in tandem with each other. Um, and again, we're doing all this in um, conjunction with satellite overpasses and working with the crews on the ground measuring with uh, towers. Um, this is from Henry Coast State Park. We worked with CAL FIRE, we worked um, uh, with Craig Clements and the University of San Jose <coughs> to conduct some fires. We had satellites from um, MODIS, 
goes, the geostationary, a larger footprint, um, but we also had airborne um, fixed wing aircraft observing it, um, and we had ground based radiometers. Again, this is from Kruger. These are our plots in the yellow. Um, zoomed in on the one that's obviously burned. You can see how in an uh, optical sensor you can see clearly a burn scar. Um, the upper left, as I have it pointed out here, is Landsat 8. The lower <coughs> right is from uh, one of our, um, our drones. And again, what we're doing is stacking these in a, um, a, a layer so that we've got ground-based observations, drone observations, aircraft, in this case we had a helicopter, um, and then we couple that with higher resolution satellite and then coarser resolution satellite. And we're trying to validate how well is the satellite doing and is there any calibration that needs to be done. Um, I'll, I'll get through these other slides pretty quickly then because there's a lot of text that we need to, need to talk about, but looking at the um, evaluating the VIRS processing streams to make sure that they're working effectively um, when they're being, these data are being used for um, their management or monitoring of fires. Same thing here where we're looking at detection, fidelity, and uncertainty. Um, this is the rim fire. Um, we're looking at both uh, instantaneous energy and um, the fires as a proxy for the burned area and burned perimeter. Um, and then we also bring some of this back into the lab. Having this collaboration with this department has been phenomenal. Um, where we've been able to use some of these radiometers and cameras, um, burn different fuels and observe characteristics of the instantaneous and integrated energy, couple that with estimating emissions from these, and then how do we tie this all back to global observations from satellites? Um, so this is just showing you different fuels that were burned um, and how much fuel was consumed given uh, the instantaneous energy. As I mentioned, if we can relate a satellite-based estimate of instantaneous energy, in this case, the FRE, fire rate of energy, is the integral um, with the biomass consumed, and you have emission factors, you can get at how much emissions were emitted to the atmosphere for a given time and place and fire. Um, okay, let me just move through some of these. I do a lot of capacity building, too. So I work with um, Alaska Interagency Coordination Center, CAL FIRE, National Inter Interagency Coordination Center up in Boise um, to sort of um, sell the Kool-Aid, I guess, right? Like, do you, does, is this information effective for fire operations, for monitoring fires, for looking at where is the fire likely to spread? Um, I don't think this will work on here. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is fire detections watching the spread over time from one of the, our satellites, the VIRS satellite. Um, so this has been very effective over time to reach out and get feedback because we often go in assuming we know what fire operations wants and we don't have a clue. Um, I, I can't tell everybody that at NASA and NOAA, but um, it's true. We often don't know, you know what we're talking about. We show up and we're like, we got all the answers for you guys. And then we get a reality check. So that's been really great. Um, and that's why, again, this sort of collaboration where you work with other departments and it's interdisciplinary, you learn a lot. I've learned a lot about fire engineering um, that I can take back into my toolbox of knowledge. So I'm going to leave. I have more slides, but I want to leave time for questions, too. Yeah. Even I think uh, this is a very nice demonstration of how we can apply technology uh, to these problems and how they can help. Uh, also, one thing that is interesting in some of your uh, detection at the global scale is, uh, even though it looks like these fires in Canada have made uh, you know the life on the east coast of America uh, uh, miserable, uh, if you look at the number of fires that we have in North America and compare to the total number of fires on the global scale. You realize, I think in the U.S. is about one percent uh, of fires compared to the. In, I'm looking at emissions, so uh, uh, compared to the global emissions from fires in, in the world. So we're looking at, uh, of course, this is impacting us, but really uh, there are uh, many more fires than what we are used to. And yeah. So that's important to put things in the framework of basically the planet Earth. With this, uh, we have uh, time for questions. Yes, please. Yeah. 
So, uh, how effective is remote sensing technology in detecting spot fires? So, for example, if there is a big fire and it's masked by the smoke, yeah. So you cannot really predict the spot fire security. No, it, it, I think um, what I want to impart is it all depends. Um, if you have a platform and a sensor that's available that's monitoring the fire, you may see it, right? If it's a high enough resolution, it's dwelling, you may see it. You're not going to see it clearly from a satellite. Um, you may not see it from fixed wing either because it may be entrained in smoke and wind that's blowing. But I suppose if you had... Um, if I go back here a moment, uh, some of these platforms that the Forest Service, the BLM, I'll just say, generally speaking, the, the fire operations and management in this country are using, they are trying to get at that, right? So something like this has been now decommissioned or no longer being used, the um, uh, Firehawk. Um, anyhow, some of these, you could, they have sensors that are high enough resolution. I didn't include some of those images where you can actually see spot fires. I've seen video of them detecting spot fires, particularly at night. It's easier at night, but you can. It all depends on your sensor, timing, um, resolution. So hopefully I answered the question. It's very vague. Yeah, so one more a small question. Sure. So, uh, so when I've been working on this database. So uh, when I look into the data, so there are like two different perimeters, you know, IR perimeter and the heat perimeter. So what is the technology behind it? Are both the same or the detecting technology? Is when you're detecting heat, is that what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, so like I've been looking into the NIROPS data, you know, for some of my projects. So like there are two different perimeters. There. So one is the IR perimeter, which is obviously from the IR cameras, you know, and the other one is like the heat perimeter. So I see those two perimeters are different. Like Yeah, so that you're talking about, you said NIROPS. Yeah. Yeah, nighttime infrared operations. So that is a little bit different. They are using an IR sensor. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily well calibrated for, that's why they fly at night, because they can't do daytime detections. It's a simple IR sensor. It's in the, the shorter wavelengths of the, the infrared. And it's an interpreter who is then looking at the image and determining, they'll say, heat sources as a cluster of IR hotspots. You know, they're getting saturated, too. They, you know, the, the radiometric resolution on that sensor is not good enough to necessarily not saturate. So that's a little different um, when they're using... Um, an interpreter, right? I took the course just to see what there's a whole training packet you can do. And they train up individuals and then they work from like 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. and then they send that information to the incident and say, here's what we determined overnight based on these flights. And they fly, they were flying two aircraft, I think they're only down to one, all night long for the most part over western U.S. during the fire season. Um, so that's a little different. So when we're detecting fires, we're looking at radiance and we're converting that to brightness temperature. Mm -hmm. And that brightness temperature is an indication of heat. It's, again, not a direct measurement. Nothing from remote sensing is a direct measurement. Um, but we are estimating the radiant heat based on the brightness temperature. And those estimates are um, correlations that we've made. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Sure. How long does it take to transmit and post-process all this high-resolution data? When I say transmit, I mean send it back to Earth. Sure. Um, if you have a, set, um, a, a receiving dish, anytime a satellite passes over, you can receive that information. So there are different um, agencies around the world that have a receiving station that if it's, let's say, one of these polar orbiting satellites, it can receive it every time that satellite comes over. And then they have to have the algorithms <coughs> to, which and we share with them. At NASA down the road here, uh, there's a whole program for this, for um, standing up these um, download stations, essentially. There's one on the top of the University of Alaska's building, so they have a receiving station. They actually have two. So the best estimate from overpass to ingest to putting it out is 30 minutes. And we're trying to improve that. So what we're getting at now is working with also a European Space Agency to use one of their satellites as some of ours are declining. Um, it's um, how frequent can you get the data and quickly process it. So again, like I said, we share the, we share the algorithms and then we want to put them out in, there's a platform called FIRMS, um, which is um, 
it, it's a platform that gets these detections out rapidly intended for fire management, whether that's fire operations or land management folks. Um, but that timing is getting better and better all the time. And would there be enough computing power, for example, running wildfire spread models on the satellite? No. So instead of transmitting, ah, okay. No, no. In fact, <laughs> but that's a dream, right? there was someone else who was talking about this, and I've worked with wildfire modelers and others. Um, the physics, as and I'm, this is not my wheelhouse, but just having spoken with people and been on fires who are like, oh, yeah, we don't trust those fire spread maps. This is they have, On fires in the U.S., you have something called a, a fire behavior analyst, an FBAN, and the, the maps are, or the models for that kind of instantaneous um, use and not research, someone was talking about this in a previous talk about, you know, whether these are operational or research, they're just not as precise. I mean, to have a really precise model. But, but assuming there is this ideal model, yeah. and you have this 30-minute uh, time window, yeah. would there be enough computing power to run? Here, on, not on the satellite, but not here. Not on the yeah. satellite. Yeah, no, here. You would do it here. You would send the data down here and then run it on a super, you know, the, the, the satellite is already limited by space and energy. You would do all that on the ground. The, the problem, as far as I understand it, is that these models are super complex. Um, and it, for fire operations, they need... I, I was talking with Sarah, Sarah about this. It's um, an old school club of fire management in this country, right? They don't... Well, I'm right. We don't need those models. I know what that fire is going to do. I've been fighting fires for 30 years. <laughs> um, so... While we like the models, and I really like the predictive nature of models, the real-time operational use is just not there yet. It, I imagine we will get there, but from what I understand, talking with people, we've been on fires, we're not there. So, uh, but you, I think we will get there. Um, yeah. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Sure. Do you think uh, in crossing a fuel map and fire map, you can you can with a for a long period? We can evaluate a deviation of the fire regime at a worldwide level. Yeah, I think so. I'm sure there's. Yeah, yeah. I just say yes broadly. Um, it, we're seeing changes already in fire characteristics, and we have showed you the seasonal length. And we already know that, right? People know that living in California, like, it seems to be burning all the time. But yeah, vegetative changes are occurring around the world um, because of land use change, um, and fire regimes are changing and. As I mentioned, m many of these fires, or most of the fires, are human ignited, and they're often occurring in places where there is not meant to be fire. Um, Southeast Asia, South America, right? that's not a, a fire-prone area like much of Africa, for example, or Australia is. So, yeah, I, I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Dave, you know, thanks very much for your talk, Kevin. I'm sure. Fascinated by all this stuff. You showed a slide there where you had the different bands that are basically doing the accuracy for yes. fire protection. Obviously, that's a is that an ideal case, or like if you only had say three or four of those bands, what's your accuracy prediction with a less, you know, a, a cheaper sensor, as it were? Um, so, if I understand correctly, if we had more channels, would it be more effective? No, if, oh. you, if you had less channels. Oh. Yeah, then you would probably have things like false alarms. You'd have what we refer to as commission and omission errors. <clears throat> yeah. So we've chosen those channels over two decades of science and studying what, what helps to determine is this a fire or not a fire. And certain places will include or remove some channels based on, as I was mentioning, their environment, their context. But this for a global product, those are the channels we use we determine it's a fire based on the four micron channel. And it, I, you can read the papers that show the context of, okay, if it's not clear there, it doesn't hit a threshold of it's over a certain 300 something Kelvin, then we go to the next one. And it's just a programming problem where you're just going through the lines and saying, okay, if this, good, no, okay, go to this thing. And then we, at the end, we say, now check, was it solar glint? Was it a coast and land barrier, a, a border? Because those will set off yeah. alarms. So yeah, th that's the ideal situation. And have you used that algorithm in just wildland areas, or have you tried applying it in urban areas? I'm not an urban guy, so I don't know. Well, that's a good thought. question. No, that's a good question. I mean, we do use, like, there's these models, maybe you're all familiar with, like, random forest, for example, yeah. right? And I use that for land cover change. So. You know, did it change because of this? What was the land use? And you're, you, the 
computing power of today is amazing. So you can do a lot with all these channels. And then you get into hyperspectral, and it's, you think it's even better, but it's really confusing too. You've got a thousand channels, and you're trying to discern what the line is that, so, yeah. Alex? Uh, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about uncertainty. Um, if you put all these building blocks together, uh, give us a sense, when you look at the global emission, what type of uncertainty are we talking about? In global emissions? Yeah, the big picture that you showed, you know. Oh, I, I'd have to read up on what the, from that, what the uncertainty is, but I would imagine it's pretty large. Um, just because anytime you start adding more pieces to exactly. your soup, there's always, there's a great uh, quote that um, I can't remember now, but basically, you propagate uncertainty as you add it more compounds. things. Yeah, yeah. So if you've got more, so that's why in, say, the GFED model, which is widely used and accepted because it's really the only global product out there that is of any value that's like pretty good, um, we all work on our own wheelhouses. So we work on the burned area and prove that to the best we can. And then, you know, someone's doing emission factors and they're doing those in the lab, not in the, the real world. And so, it's the best estimate we have. I don't think sometimes you need to be accurate as you need to be precise, right? You just need to be like, if it's changing from one year to the next, you're following, it's changing. And that's not a result of poor accuracy. You know, it's not going up and down. It's just, okay, the emissions are changing from year to year, not because of the model, but because they're actually changing. The absolute value may not be spot on, but maybe we don't need to know that as much as we need to know the trend and behavior of emissions, so. All right. I'm sorry we are going yeah, to, yeah. to transition. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>